Front Desk, Chapter 62 My parents thought it was a joke. You want your aunt to buy the Calavista? They burst out laughing. Why not? I asked. I showed them Shen's letter, the part about how everyone in the city was buying, was starting to buy up property. They're not going to buy a motel, my dad said. Fine, they don't have to buy it, but they can lend us the money, we can buy it, and we can run it with Lupe and her family, I said. They don't have that kind of money, my dad said. If they did, they wouldn't be in China. Well, it doesn't hurt to ask, I said. No way, my mom screwed up her face. I'm not going to ask my sister for money. Sometimes when my parents got like this, I really wanted to spray them with all-purpose cleaner. Don't you guys want to get off the roller coaster? I asked. Mr. Yao wants to sell the motel. I heard him on the phone. He's desperate. Aunt Julie has money now. We could buy the motel. Don't you see what a huge opportunity this is? No, my mom didn't see. I see your heads in the clouds is what I see, my mom said flatly. Hank found me later that afternoon sitting at the back of the stairs. Why so blue, he asked, taking a seat. I shrugged. You still thinking about your lucky pennies? I shook my head. I wasn't thinking about those lucky pennies. I was thinking about I was thinking about this one the humongous penny staring us in the face. It was called family and my parents refused to pick it up. When I told Hank, he got up, patted my head and said, "Don't worry, leave it to me." He walked up to where my parents made cart was and I followed him. My parents were in room 13 cleaning. Hank walked in and sat down on the bed. You know, it's a funny thing, pride, Hank said to my parents. It stopped me many times in my life. Hank glanced at me and added, and I'm not just talking about my reference letter. My mom put her broom down and wiped the sweat off her forehead. She sat down on the bed next to Hank. Hank took a deep breath and gazed outside at the general direction of the pool. I'm talking about when I was young, he sighed. When I was six, I wanted to be a swimmer. I just loved watching swimming on TV. There wasn't a pool in my neighborhood, so I would walk five miles to the Y over in the next town to go swimming, and I got pretty good. In high school, I tried out for the swim team, and you know what? I made it too. I made it onto the team, I smiled. So then what happened? I asked. Hank grimaced. He told us about the other kids on the team and how they kept making fun of him. They kept saying stuff like, the basketball court's that way, and why are you putting on sunscreen? You don't need sunscreen. Stuff like that, he shook his head. I reached over and put my hand over his. I thought I would show them in the water, you know, show them how fast I was. That'll shut them up. But the day of the big meet came, and guess what? What? I asked. I was dead last. I wasn't even close. So you know what I did? What? I quit. Just walked on out and never came back, he said. Good for you, my mom said. You're better off without them. See, that's what I used to think. But now you know what I think? I think if it were Mia, she wouldn't have quit. She wouldn't have let those punks take away her dream. She would have worked hard and gotten better. So what if you lose the first race? You get back in there and keep swimming. And you know something? She would have been right. I thought back to all the times Hank walked by the pool, how he always stopped and stared at it, his mind a million miles away. Hank turned back to my parents. The point I'm trying to make is you can't let a useless thing like pride get in the way of your dreams, Hank said. That's what I realized this year, Hank pointed to me. Now you've got a very special little girl here. You owe it to her to swallow your pride, he said. I've been around long enough to know there aren't many chances in life for our lot to change our luck. And this is it. You're staring at it. Yao's dying to sell the motel. But it's not that simple. I've been lying to my sisters about how great our life here is, my mom confessed. So tell them the truth. No skin off your back, Hank said. My mom looked hesitantly at my dad. Hank's got a point, my dad said. Please, mom, I asked. My mom peered into my eyes. Hesitation melted into resolve. Slowly, she stretched out her hand. Give me the phone, my mom said. We all crowded around my mother as she picked up the phone in the room and dialed international for my aunt, a number she knew by heart, yet never used.
My father looked at her at his watch. What time is it over there? He wondered. Probably nine, ten in the morning. We waited and waited until it rang. Finally, on the fifth ring, my aunt picked up. Julie, my mother said to her in rapid Chinese, it's Ying. My mother's face lit up when she heard her sister's voice. I guess all the lies in the world couldn't pull two sisters apart. We're doing great, my mom said. Everything's fine. Just terrific. Uh Uh-oh. I could feel her Macy's voice coming on. Listen, the reason I called is I have an opportunity for you, my mom said. My mom glanced hesitantly at my dad, who nodded. Go on. How would you like to invest in some American property? A pause. Yeah, I said American property, my mother repeated. Not just any property, a motel. See, the owner of our motel, Mr. Yao, is selling his motel. And I just thought, I could hear my aunt's animated voice on the other line, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. No, you wouldn't have to run it. We could run it for you. It's a real cash cow, this motel, my mom said. A wonderful opportunity. My mom's face fell. I see. I could tell from the look on my mom's face my aunt wasn't going for it. My mom held her hand over the receiver and whispered to us. She says they're saving up to buy an apartment in Beijing for Shen. An apartment for Shen? Shen's only ten! No, of course, I understand. But listen, you don't have to put in a lot. You could ask Kin, Lan, Biming. You could... Ask the whole neighborhood. Everybody could each put in a little. Kin, Lan, Biming were my mother's other siblings. My mom frowned. Oh, they want to buy an apartment in Beijing too? Huh, she said. My mom shifted her foot from one foot to the other. I could tell she was ready to give up and I poked her. No, my mom looked over at us. Tell her, my dad mouthed. Okay, listen. She sighed into the phone. The truth is, we're really struggling here. Slowly, my mom put aside her Macy's voice and told my aunt the truth. So, I'm asking, my mom said at last, her voice shaking. Will you help us, sis? There was a long pause on the other end of the line during which my mom, Hank, and I held our breaths. As my aunt delivered her verdict, my mom sank onto the bed. Chapter 63 My mother was inconsolable that night. She couldn't believe that her sister would rather buy a fancy penthouse in Beijing than help her own sibling. As she buried her head into her pillow, my father tried his best to comfort her. I can't believe she said no, my mom said to my dad. I couldn't either. Never in a million years did I think my aunt would say no. Not after my mom told her what we were going through. I guess a lot had changed since we left. Not just the neighborhood, but the people too. They were probably splitting the bill now. It's okay, my dad said. We tried. You heard what Hank said. It's no skin off our back. It is, my mom cried. It's the skin and the hair and everything. I bit my lip as I listened from my bed. Now we'll just be employees for the rest of our lives, working for one bastard after another. Not everyone can lead, Ying, my dad said. Some people are just destined to be followers. As my father started going on about our fate again, I threw my head back onto the pillow. I didn't believe we were destined to be followers. I didn't believe we were just supposed to stay on the roller coaster forever. I thought about all the people I'd met this year and how we all deserved better. Lupe, Hank, the other weeklies, and all the immigrants. So many wonderful people from so many different parts of the world. If only there was a way we could join together and break free. Wait a minute. What if we didn't need one rich relative? What if what we needed instead were a lot of poor people? My mom said it herself. Everyone could each put in a little. Lupe came straight over the next day, and I squealed when I told her my plan. Of course, why didn't we think of this earlier? Mr. Yao desperately wants to sell the motel. We could probably get it for cheap. She grabbed my hand, and we ran out the back to find Hank. It was Saturday, and Hank was outside his room watering his tomato plant. How much do you think Mr. Yao wants for the motel? We asked him. 
Hank stopped watering and drew a sharp breath. At least $300,000, I'd say. Why? Did you guys find another rich relative? No, we were all out of those, but we knew a lot of people. Sure, they were all poor, but if everybody put in a little, and it wouldn't be in a donation, it'd be an investment. We'd own the hotel motel together, I told Hank. I pulled out my notebook and showed him and Lu- him and Lupe my calculations. Their eyes boggled when they saw the math. This place makes $12,000 a month, Lupe asked. Holy, that's serious money! Hank exclaimed, $144,000 a year. Serious, to be exact. Hank slapped his leg. That's it, I'm in, he declared. Hank emptied every pocket of his jacket. He hung his fingers into the backs of his chairs and checked under his bed for money. He even checked in his shoes. He managed to find $78.56, which wasn't a lot, but it was something. The other weeklies, as soon as they heard, wanted to contribute too. Fred put in $100 and Billy Bob put in 200 Mrs. T contributed 250 but it was Mrs. Q who put in the most, a whopping $3,000. Hank whistled. We got $3,000 laying around and you're living in this dump, he asked her. Why don't you get an apartment? This isn't a dump, Mrs. Q said. This is home. And besides, if I lived in an apartment, I'd never meet all of you wonderful people. She gave my shoulder a squeeze. Lupe skipped on home to talk to her parents. She said they had some sort of emergency fund, but she wasn't sure how much was in it in there. As for me, I dug out my essay from the contest. I made copies of the essay and passed it out to every single customer who came in. My plan was simple. Find 600 people to contribute $500 each. That would bring us to a total grand total of $300,000. So far, we got $3,628 from the weeklies. We still had 296371 to go. A few customers threw my story in the trash, but a surprising number didn't. They responded with genuine interest and curiosity. A few more m- moved by what a few were moved by what I told them about our situation and the kind of year we had been having and how we got through it by pulling together as a family. They opened up their checkbooks and wrote checks for seven hundred dollars, one thousand dollars, four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, and even eight thousand dollars. One customer wanted to know my vision for the Calavista. His name was Mr. Cooper, and he was a venture capitalist from Los Angeles, passing through on his way down to San Diego. A venture capitalist, Mr. Cooper said, was someone who invested in small companies before they became big companies. Though he could afford to stay anywhere, Mr. Cooper still liked living frugally, and that's why he was at the Cala Vista. Where do you see the Cala Vista in five years? Mr. Cooper asked me. Right here, I said, a little confused by his question. He laughed. No, I mean, what kind of things do you expect from the Cala Vista? I thought about it and said, I just want everyone to be happy, every single customer. Mr. Cooper smiled. That's the kind of vision I like to hear. I'd be honored to invest, he said. Mr. Cooper took out his checkbook and wrote us a check for a jaw-dropping $50,000. As he handed us the enormous check, my mother's hands shook. She'd never seen so many zeros all in one place. I'm expecting big things from this place, Mr. Cooper beamed. Big things. With Mr. Cooper's check and the other customers' contributions, we still needed about $230,000. So the next day, I went around to all the shops on our street. To my wild surprise, both Mr. Abayan from the convenience store and Mr. Bhagawati from the dry cleaners wanted to invest. Are you sure? I asked them. Are you kidding? This is our chance to own a piece of land in America, they said. They were tired of sending all their money back to their relatives month after month. For once, they were going to spend on themselves. They they gave me $1,000 each cash. I ran all the way home, clutching the thick stacks of hundreds in my hands. Lupe came over with even more thrilling news. Her parents talked it over and they wanted to invest $10,000, the entirety of their emergency fund. But it's your emergency fund, I said. Are you sure about this? Lupe nodded. 
We've never been more sure of anything in our life, she said. As her dad added his chunk to the huge pile of money, Lupe and I grabbed each other's arms and jumped up and down screaming, we're getting off the roller coaster, we're getting off the roller coaster. By the end of the week, we were $85,000 down, 215000 to go. I took out the big ledger and started writing to old customers. I wrote to Mr. Lewis, the guy who gave me a hard time about the key and wanted all those extra pillows. To my surprise, he wrote me back and sent me a check for $100 along with a gift certificate to Home Depot for a better key machine. Mr. and Mrs. Miller, the nice couple who gave me an $8 tip, sent $75. They told their friend about it, a guy who made a fortune selling mops on the home shopping channel on TV. He called us up and wanted to invest. My dad then got on the phone and started calling up some of the immigrants who had stayed in our motel. When the immigrants heard, they wanted to get in on the deal too. Aunt Ling, Uncle Lee, Uncle Fang, and Uncle Zhu each invested $100, $125, $150, and $200. Even Uncle Zhang, who had just gotten a new job parking cars at a parking garage, put in $88, which pleased my parents very much because of the number 8. Word got out that there was a killer investment opportunity, and soon immigrants all up and down the state were coming over to invest. If we can't have the American dream ourselves, maybe we can have it together, the immigrants exclaimed. My parents were in awe. That could not get, they could not get over the fact that so many people, total strangers, could believe in them like that could look at them and decide, hey, I don't know you, but I believe in you. I believe in your dream. And put green, crisp, and put gr- crisp green bills into their tired, blistered hands. One stranger after another, flesh and bones, that looked into their eyes and said yes, when time and time again, they looked at themselves and said no. Two weeks later, an even more amazing thing happened. Hank walked into the front office with a stack of bills. He slid the cash across the front desk, a thick stack of 20s. You found more money? he asked. No, you found more money, he said. I furrowed my eyebrows at him. I didn't understand. I got your money back from the essay people, he announced. You what? I couldn't believe my ears. How? I took a page from your book, he said. I wrote them a letter. I reached over and touched the fresh green bills. My lucky penny money. I never thought I'd see it again. When I exclaimed to them how young you are and how hard you worked for that money, they returned it like that. Hank snapped his fingers. Oh, Hank, thank you, I said. He waved away my thanks like it was nothing, even though what he did meant the world to me. So, What are you going to do with it? Hank asked. I'll tell you what I'm going to do with it, I said. I'm buying a motel with it. That's my girl, Hank beamed. I wrote the Vermont people to say thank you for returning the money. That's when I had an idea. Dear Vermont Motel SA organizers, thank you so much for returning my entry fee. Can you do me a huge favor? Can you please kindly... Help me send the following letter out to all the other people who entered the essay contest but did not win. It would be a lot, it would mean a lot to me. Thank you, Mia Tang. Letter attached. Dear sir, madam, my name is Mia Tang. I am ten years old, and like you, I also entered the Vermont Motel Giveaway Essay Contest. For the past year, I have been helping my parents manage a motel in Anaheim, California. We have made it our home from the towels we carefully fold each and every day to the customers we call family. But you see, the motel is not ours. It belongs to a man named Mr. Yao, who is unkind and unjust and stubborn as a rock. My parents think that working for Mr. Yao was the only way, but I don't think so. At night, I dreamed of a better way. I dreamed of owning a motel one day that was ours. So I entered the Vermont Motel Giveaway um, Essay Contest. Sadly, though, I did not win. I always knew losing was a possibility, but what are the chances of actually winning a motel? But still, it hurt. I watched my hopes and dreams disappear. You probably know the feeling. 
Well, maybe all our hopes and dreams don't have to disappear. I am writing to you because something has happened here at the Calavista Motel. Mr. Yao is selling the motel. He's selling it for cheap because he's desperate. We're all chipping in to see if we can buy it from him and we're looking for investors. If you would like to invest, please let me know. It wouldn't be a donation. It would be one of the owners. You would be one of the owners. And in the future, whenever a customer comes to stay at the Cala Vista, part of that money would go to you. You might be asking yourself, why should I invest in a motel from a 10 year old? For three reasons. One, I know what I'm doing. I know every corner of this motel like the back of my hand because I've lived here and worked here for almost a year. Two, I love what I'm doing. I'm very proud of my work. Every day I check people in at the front desk. The customers like you, me see enclosed feedback cards because I always go the extra mile for them. Three, I won't let you down. I will work hard every day for my dream and yours. So, what do you say? If we can't win a motel together, let's buy one. No investment is too small. Even if all you have are some extra pennies and nickels lying around, we'll take them. You'd be amazed what some of them are worth. I look forward to hearing from you. Yours truly, Mia Tang, Manager. A few weeks later, the check started rolling in. The Vermont SA people sent my letter out, and to my absolute amazement, people from all over the country sent in checks from $50, $100, $2,000, and even $10,000. By the end of that incredible month, and with everyone else's investment, we reached $300,000. We cashed the checks at the bank and kept all the cash in a giant trash bag which my parents held in their arms at all times and slept with at night in case any robbers came.